In the real world, everything has some sort of variation to it. For example, some people are taller than others, some light bulbs burn out faster than others, and in some years, the amount of rainfall in an ecosystem can be more than in other years. However, a very common thing in video games is to have everything be the exact same. Maybe your sword does the exact same amount of damage every time you use it, or maybe the amount of enemies that get spawned per wave is exactly the same. Your games can feel less predictable and more alive if you incorporate some of the variation seen in the real world into them. And it's really easy to do. So here's how you can add limitless variation to your games with only one line of code. This video is broken up into four distinct sections. The first one will be about how normal distributions work. The second will be about how to easily implement what we learned in section one into our games. The third section will provide some more context and explain how the code works. And the fourth section is a top secret bonus section that goes into another more customizable implementation that you do not want to miss. Awesome, let's get on with it. All of the real world examples I mentioned at the start of the video follow normal distributions. And in this first section, we're gonna learn how they work. We'll look more closely at height because it's a classic example. If you were to ask every American male who is at least 20 years old how tall they are, you would get a lot of different answers. The average answer would be 70 inches or 5'10", but some people might say they're 6'2", or 5'3". If we decided to plot every height, we would get something that looks like this shape right here. This is a normal distribution, sometimes referred to as a bell curve. Take a second to look at this curve and see if you notice anything specific about our average. It falls dead center and has the highest point. This is because most people are, well, average. And in statistics, which is what we're doing right now, we call the average the mean and we represent it with this funny looking U called mu. So for this distribution, we can say that the mean is 70. If the mean changes, the whole distribution appears to slide left or right. There is one more property that defines our normal distribution, and that's what we call the standard deviation, and it's represented by this symbol called sigma. The mean tells us where we are centered, and our standard deviation tells us how close our data is to the center. In our height example, we have a standard deviation of 3 inches. If this standard deviation gets smaller, the data will be pulled towards the mean, and if it gets bigger, it will be more spread out. Now listen up, because this is an important part. There is a rule that 68% of the data in a normal distribution lies between one standard deviation above the mean and one standard deviation below the mean. This means that 68% of men are between 67 inches and 73 inches, or between 5'7 and 6'1. 95% of the data is two standard deviations out, so 95% of men are between 5'4 and 6'4. Lastly, 99.7% of men are three standard deviations out. So let's have a little example. Say we have a game that spawns in enemies, and all the enemies are exactly the same. We can pick one property of our enemies to distribute over the normal distribution, to add some variation. You could literally pick anything, but I'll choose speed. The first thing we need to do is determine the mean. For the most part, the mean will be the current value you're already using. So in the case of the enemy, that would be 4 meters per second. Now we need to think about our standard deviation. The best way to do this is to come up with a range you would want 70% of your enemies to be in. I think between 3.25 and 4.75 could work, so our standard deviation will be 0.75. Now that we know how normal distributions work, and that we've picked out our mean and standard deviation, let's move into section 2 where we implement it. Here, we have a very basic Unity scene. When I hit play, every three seconds, an enemy runs across the screen with a speed of four meters per second. So let's add in some variation. If we open up our enemy mover script, we can see that we've got a bit of code that makes our enemy move. But the thing that concerns us right now is this line right here, max speed equals four. Instead of having max speed be four for every enemy, let's change it to use a normal distribution. Like I said in the title of the video, we really only need one line of code. And that's this right here. That code will be in the description of the video, so you can just copy and paste it in. I believe mathf and random.value are unity only things, but it can be easily translated using doubles with system.math and system.random. Now all we have to do is replace the current assignment to four in max speed to call get random over normal distribution with four passed in as our mean and 0.75 passed in as our standard deviation. I'll also log our speed into the console so we don't have to guess how fast they're going with our eyes. Heading back into Unity, we can hit play, and our implementation, believe it or not, is complete. However, I don't know about you, but I don't like having long, unreadable one-line functions. So I'm going to quickly implement this in a different, more readable way. 
So the first thing I am going to do now is paste in this new class called normal distribution. A link to this code will be in the description. Next, I'm going to go into our enemy mover class and make a function that lets us set our max speed. Next up, we're going to go into our enemy spawner script and make a private normal distribution called speed distribution. In the start function, we'll initialize the speed distribution to equal a new normal distribution with 4 and 0.75 passed in as arguments. Here, we set up the mean and standard deviation right away. Then, in our enemy spawn function, we can make a float called random speed and set that equal to speed distribution dot get random value. Finally, we get the enemy mover component and call the set max speed function, passing in our random speed. Heading back into Unity, we can hit play and see that everything works exactly the same. But now we've made a much cleaner implementation. Now, there's one more thing I quickly want to mention in this section. And that is in the super unlikely event, the normal distribution can go so far to the left that it'll output a negative number, which in this case means the enemy would move in the opposite direction. We can remedy this by clamping the output of the function. With the second implementation, I have a function in the normal distribution class that does just that, called getRandomValueClamped. Let's change to that here and put 0.5 in for the min and like 10,000 for the max. Everything works pretty much identically, but now we have peace of mind that everything won't break if we get insanely unlucky. So I'm going to start off section three with a little confession about the code I provided you. Um, it's a lie. It's not a normal distribution. It's a pretty darn close approximation, but it isn't quite a normal distribution. Remember our 68, 95, 99.7 rule from earlier? Well, the approximation is 66, 92, 98.3. So it's pretty close, but not perfect. I'll get into the code towards the end of this section, but to understand it, we need a little bit more context. And don't tune this part out, because it's going to be helpful for our next section. Let's take a look at our bell curve, with a mean of 0 and a standard deviation of 1. This right here is called our standard normal distribution. This curve is defined by the equation y equals 1 divided by the square root of 2 pi times e to the 0.5x squared. And much like all of our other normal distributions, it is what's known as a probability density function. Oh, and if you're curious as to where the pi comes from, I'll have some links in the description, but it's a bit out of the scope of this video. So what's a probability density function? Well, PDFs are functions that tell us the probability that a random variable falls between two values. So this part can be a bit confusing, so just bear with me. But the height of a PDF doesn't really tell us anything about the probability. What we look for instead is the area underneath the curve. Because the area under the curve represents the probability, the total area underneath the entire curve must be 1. Now those of us who are versed in calculus have their integral bells ringing right now. So for those of you who know what you're doing, go ahead, find me the antiderivative. It's OK. I'll wait. Psych, I won't, because you can't. This is a non-elementary integral, which means it doesn't have an antiderivative. Or Rather, it doesn't have a usual antiderivative. So this means we have to make up brand new functions to solve them. If you don't understand calculus, don't worry, because everyone watching who does is now super confused, just like you. So long story short, that's why I have to approximate and not use the real thing. So how the heck do we approximate? Well, first we have to talk about what's called a CDF. A CDF, or cumulative distribution function, takes in a value and then outputs the area under the curve from negative infinity to the input, which is basically just the probability. This is like saying, what is the probability that a randomly selected male is under 72 inches? We answer this by plugging in 72 into the CDF and checking what we get. The answer is 0.75. So girls, stop being so picky. Now even though we don't know what our CDF will look like, Desmos does, by graphing y equals 1 over the square root of 2 pi, times the integral from negative infinity to x of e to the negative 0.5t squared dt, we get this lovely looking curve right here. Even though this curve is made up by stuff we don't use in our day-to-day -day math, it looks awfully similar to some of the stuff we do use. In my opinion, it looks like the graph of arctan with some transformations, and it also looks like the graph of a logistic growth function, or sigmoid. I tried using both to get an approximation, but the sigmoid approximation was just a bit more accurate, so we won't waste any more time on arctangent. A 
A sigmoid is expressed by the function y equals 1 over 1 plus e to the negative x. However, we can stretch or shrink this by instead raising e to the negative kx, where k is some constant. Now it's a game of trying to find the best value k. And spoiler alert, it's 4 divided by the square root of 2 pi. At least I'm very confident it is. If you were wondering where I got this mystery number, I took the derivative of our sigmoid and set it equal to the derivative of our CDF evaluated at 0. Alright, there's just one more thing we need to do. Convert our CDF into a quantile function, or inverse CDF. With the CDF, we took in a value and outputted a probability. But with the quantile, we take in a probability and output a value. All we have to do to get this quantile function is just swap the x's and y's and solve for y. The quantile function for our approximated CDF is the negative natural logarithm of 1 divided by x minus 1 all divided by k. So this means we can input a random probability and get a value that corresponds to it with the normal distribution. So we will have most of our values pretty close to zero and pretty much nothing past negative three and positive three. Um, that's great, Will, but if we're modeling heights of males, it doesn't make sense to have them between negative three and three inches. Very true, viewer, but this is a pretty easy fix. Right now, because we're using the standard normal distribution, our output of value is what's called a z-score, or the number of standard deviations we are from the mean. Say we get the random number 0.84. When we run this through the quantile function, we get 1.04, which means we want to return a number that is 1.04 standard deviations away from the mean. Going back to height, this would be the mean, 70, plus the z-score of 1.04 times the standard deviation of 3, to get a height of 73.12 inches. Awesome. Now with that context out of the way, let's look at the code. In our constructor, we set our mean and standard deviation values to what they're supposed to be. Then we make a new random object so we can generate random probabilities. In our getRandomValue function, we start by getting a random probability, which is just a random number between 0 and 1. Next, we get our z-score by using that quantile function we found earlier. Oh, yeah, and that gross decimal is just 1 divided by k. I computed this in advance to avoid doing square root functions on the fly, because those are pretty slow. Finally, we multiply our z-score by the standard deviation and add it to the mean to get the random value on the normal distribution. Our getRandomValueClamped function simply calls the getRandomValue function and then clamps it to the parameters. Once you understand what's going on, the code is actually really simple, and the single line from earlier is just the getRandomValue function smushed into one line of code. Now, it's time for the bonus section. This is awesome. We now have a way to add some variation into our games, but I would advise you to use this sparingly. Because one, if nothing in your game is consistent, it could feel like a big random mess. And two, it might just make your player angry. Let's empathize with your player for a second. They have a sword that does 20 damage. You tell them that the mean is 20 damage because that's easier for them to understand, but it also has a standard deviation of two. The player attacks three times with their sword, and the sword first does 17 damage, then 19 damage, and then 17 damage again. Then the enemy kills the player, and it only has one hit point left. If you were the player, how would you feel? Probably angry and betrayed because you were promised 20 damage and you got less. Now you could choose to just not have the weapon do various amounts of damage, but you could also do something else. Why? We can say it does 20 damage, but in the long run, actually have it do more. To do this, you could blatantly lie and make the mean 21 damage, or you could make your own quantile function, which is going to be the focus of this final bonus section. This may sound like it's going to be super hard and confusing, and for my non-Unity friends, I'm going to be honest, it might just be. But in Unity, we can use animation curves. For this example, I'm going to do this with the speedy enemies from section 2, but something like that, where it isn't something we'd necessarily lie about, it's usually best to just stick with a normal distribution. So step one is to make an animation curve. So in your script, type private animation curve max speed curve. Next, make sure you mark it with the serialize field attribute so it shows up in the inspector. You could also just mark it as public if it's easier for you to understand. Now we will go down to where we get our random speed and set it to our max speed curve dot evaluate and then pass in random dot value to get a number between 0 and 1. Now it's time to actually make our distribution. So hop back into Unity and click on the spot for our animation curve and draw your quantile function. To edit the points directly, right click and type in the x coordinate, which is time, and the y coordinate, which is the value. Also remember your quantile rules. Time of zero should be where the minimum value is, and time of one is where the maximum value should be. Steeper sections mean that it's less likely to be around that number, and flatter sections mean that the value will be more common. 
Here, I have about 20% of all enemies spawning in with speeds ranging from a speed of one to a speed of four. This part is what we call concave down. So we get more higher numbers and less lower numbers. After four, we have a relatively flat section. So a lot of our enemies will be a bit faster than four. Then it goes concave up. So we have less eight speed enemies than say five speed enemies. We can also make more bimodal distributions by having two relatively flat sections. This means there will be two common types of speeds that can be achieved. Also, a straight line between your min and max means that every value has an equal chance of being chosen. This is called a uniform distribution. Your average will be what's in the middle, but you're just as likely to get your max value or your min value as you are to get your average. Thank you so much for watching. Because you made it this far into the video, you're obviously interested in this technique. So just click the link in the description and copy and paste the normal distribution class. It's completely free, but I would ask you to check out some of my other stuff if this is your first time ever watching me. You know that game chess? Well, I made it better, which you can watch right here. Or check out this video that YouTube thinks you'd really like. Thanks again. See you soon.